we are, we are continuing study on body life, okay, and uh, yesterday we talked about uh, uh, the, the, the whole area of whose world is it, God's world, Satan's world, as well as Christ's world. Uh, uh, today we'll do the, in the way, a second part, four ways to engage the world, four ways to engage the world that David Paulson talked about. Uh, I've once again purposely put in the scripture reading from uh, John 17, okay, we hear him read again. John, minutes, John 17, and then uh, we'll, we'll then listen to his sharing. Okay. Turn your Bible to John 17 and follow what he's reading. Will you turn to John chapter 17? <clears throat> We're going into the Holy of Holies here. It's always a privilege to listen to somebody praying privately, but especially when that's, that prayer comes from the lips of Jesus, the Son of God. John chapter 17, page 140, in the New Testament of the Good News Bible. And Jesus finished saying this. He looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Give glory to your Son, so that the Son may give glory to you. For you gave him authority over all mankind, so that he might give eternal life to all those you gave him. And eternal life means knowing you, the only true God, and knowing Jesus Christ, whom you sent. I have shown your glory on earth. I finished the work you gave me to do. Father, give me glory in your presence now, the same glory I had with you before the world was made. I have made you known to those you gave me out of the world. They belong to you, and you gave them to me. They have obeyed your word, and now they know that everything you gave me comes from you. I gave them the message that you gave me, and they received it. They know that it is true that I came from you, and they believe that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those you gave me, for they belong to you. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine and my glory is shown through them. And now I am coming to you. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. Holy Father, keep them safe by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one, just as you and I are one. While I was with them, I kept them safe by the power of your name, the name you gave me. I protected them, and not one of them was lost, except the man who was bound to be lost, so that the scripture might come true. And now I am coming to you, and I say these things in the world, so that they might have my joy in their hearts in all its fullness. I gave them your message, and the world hated them, because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but I do ask you to keep them safe from the evil one. Just as I do not belong to the world, they do not belong to the world. Dedicate them to yourself by means of the truth. Your word is truth. I sent them into the world just as you sent me into the world, and for their sake I dedicate myself to you in order that they too may be truly dedicated to you. I pray not only for them, but also for those who believe in me because of their message. I pray that they may all be one. Father, may they be in us, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they be one so that the world will believe that you sent me. I gave them the same glory you gave me so that they may be one just as you and I are one, I in them, and you in me, so that they may be completely one, in order that the world may know that you sent me, and that you love them as you love me. Father, you have given them to me, and I want them to be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory, the glory you gave me, for you loved me before the world was made. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you sent me. I made you known to them, and I will continue to do so, in order that the love you have for me may be in them, 
and so that I also may be in them. Let me just simply describe the four levels at which we are called to be in the world. The first is rather encouraging and it is that we can in fact influence the world simply by being present in it. Simply by being present in it. I think of a young man who came into the RAF out in Aden into a barrack room that was filled with lewd pictures above each bunk and out of his kit bag he took his pin up a picture of Jesus Christ and just hung it up by his bunk and within two days every other picture had been taken off the walls I think of another man of whom it was said to me recently you know when he is in the room I feel I cannot tell a lie I think of Edgar Wallace who lived in the same road as a Christian called Benjamin Hellier and Edgar Wallace the mystery thriller who had no real faith in God said I cannot be an atheist as long as Benjamin Hellier is living in our road here is the first way in which Christians are going to be an influence in the world salt and light but those two pictures have within them two very profound principles one is that a Christian must be in the world to operate and the second is that the world must not be in the Christian to operate isn't it strange that so often we've interpreted the Bible teaching on the world as meaning that we must get out of the world in fact usually when we do we bring a lot of the world with us inside it wasn't only St. Anthony who discovered that in the desert. In fact, it is the very opposite that was Jesus' will. I pray not that you'll take them out of the world, send them into it, but keep them from the evil one. You see, salt is no use once the world has got in and mixed it up. And light is no use unless it's placed where men can see. Men do not see us in prayer meetings. They do not see us in services. They see us when we're on the lampstand. And so the message of salt and light is the world must not be in us, but we must be in the world. Then without saying anything, simply by being what God has called us to be, we are already an influence. The second way is to ask what areas of the world I can claim for Jesus Christ. Last weekend I was in an industrial town in the Midlands and I met three men within 24 hours and each of them thrilled my heart because industry as you know is a, a whole area of life that is largely untouched by Jesus Christ. The first man I met was a manager in a small factory making oil filters for cars. He was a member of the Salvation Army, played the band, led the Songster Brigade. But as the manager in this factory, he was having endless trouble. On each shop floor, there were agitators. And finally, he was desperate in his job as manager. And he decided to do something that should have occurred to him long before, but it was a new thought. A short while ago, he told me, he said, Jesus, I'm going to take you in to the shop floor. And you sort it out. Now, he'd been a regular salvationist for years, good Christian, but he'd never thought of doing this. And so the next Monday morning, he walked into the factory floor, and Monday morning isn't a good morning for industrial relationships. And he went right into a situation, but as he went in, he just closed his eyes for a moment and said, Jesus, this is your shop floor. Now take it over. Now to see his face as he described to me what happened was just beautiful. His face lit up, he said, it worked. He took over. He said, life has been so different. He had never seen the shop floor as something to be taken over in the name of Jesus. He's not throwing his religion at the men. He just realized that God didn't just want him singing in the songster brigade or blowing his trumpet in the core on Sunday, but claiming the kingdom of Christ on the factory floor second man I met was a shop steward in a large motor manufacturing factory. Would you like to be in that job? And yet he told me how a group of men meet with him once a week at six o'clock in the morning to pray through every dispute that arises, 
to find out what Christ wants to do in that dispute. And the influence that that man is having is growing quite rapidly. The third man I met was an engineer with the gas board. And I asked him about his job. He said, well, we're facing a real crisis in the gas board, a crisis of far too much money. He said, having to lift the price of gas to be on a par with other energy sources, we're going to make a bonanza this year. We're going to make the biggest profit any nationalized industry has ever made. We're going to be really rolling in it. And he said, what is happening is that all the men are going to agitate for a massive rise in wages that will fuel a spiral of wage demands in the other industries that's just going to be devastating for the country. They know the money's there and they're saying, we're going to get that. And they're asking for a massive inflation. What are you going to do? Well, he said, I'll tell you what we've done. And once again, they got to prayer and they said, Lord, this is the world. We want it to be your world. What are you saying in this situation? And that engineer went along to the trade union in the name of Christ to expose greed and a self-interest that was quite unconcerned as to what would happen to other people. And the result was out of 12 districts in this country in gas, that district, that one, has refused to make the demand for their share of this great windfall that's coming. And that's gone right up to the top. Now the other 11 have sadly said they're going to ask for that money. But here was this man and he said the others came to see. They're not Christians. But they came to see that this was greed and self-interest and was working against others and certainly could not express any love of neighbor. You know, the trade unions were built on a concern for other people. They were built on love of neighbor. So much so that a trade union meeting is still called a chapel. A chapel. Here was a chapel in the industrial Midlands where Christians were saying, we can take this part of the world for Christ. And we're going to. It was very thrilling to meet those three men who'd grasped that the Lord is calling for a demonstration within the kingdom of Satan that the kingdom of Christ can restore the kingdom of God, who realize that the world can be gained and can be restored. The third way in which we are called to go into the world is to go and liberate individuals from the powers of darkness. This is the call to evangelism. It is the sad truth that still to this day it takes 33 Christians 12 months to win one person for Christ. That's a sobering thought. That's in this country. That is not true elsewhere. Who have you got your sight on? Have you anybody that you're really hoping to win for the Lord? I think of a student who went to Cambridge. His name was John. And John went to Cambridge and one day was watching on the Cambridge sports field a game of cricket. And he saw the captain of the team, a fine, tall, handsome man, obviously gifted in leadership. And John, the student, said, I, I covered that man for the kingdom of Christ. I'm going to get hold of that man for Christ. What did he do? He didn't play cricket, so he said, I'm going to have to learn. And it took him a long time. And he practiced, he went to the nets, he slogged away, and gradually he became better, until he was good enough to be chosen to play in the same team as this man. Then he made friends with him. Gradually his prayers closed around this man. And that's how David Shepherd became a Christian. Did you know that? now the Bishop of Liverpool. It was because one Christian student said, I'm going to capture that man for Christ. I want him in the kingdom. It's a, a wonderful yet sobering thought that if each of us during the next 12 months just said, I'm going to capture one, just someone, liberate them from the kingdom of darkness, translate them into the kingdom of the Son of His love by the grace of Christ, that could transform the situation. 
Well, these are the ways in which we're going to go into the world. Can I tell you that one of the most precious promises that Jesus ever made is conditional on our going into the world? If we run away from the world, we cannot claim that promise. If we shelter ourselves in a spiritual ghetto, if we become so preoccupied with our own concerns and our own survival, then the spiritual law will operate. Whoever would save his life will lose it. But the promise to which I'm referring comes at the end of Matthew's Gospel, where Jesus sent them into the world, having said, it's my world, I'm in authority, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. Now you go, you go, get into it. And lo, I am with you. That could mean that a deeper sense of the presence of Christ is awaiting those who go. As I talk to these three men in this industrial town, I noticed that the sense of the presence of Christ had been so real, not in the church, not in the prayer meeting that had backed them, but in the world where they'd gone. That's where Christ is to be found. That's where he wants to be found. There is a little poem which is written by someone, I don't know who, who had a real battle with the Lord over this, and I just want to read it to you as one person's experience of what I've been saying. I said, let me walk in the fields. He said, no, walk in the town. I said, there are no flowers there. He said, no flowers but a crown. I said that the sky is black and there is nothing but noise and din. But he wept as he led me back. There is more, he said. There is sin. I said, but the air is thick and fogs are veiling the sun. He announced, yet hearts are sick and souls in the dark undone. I said, I shall miss the light and friends will miss me, they say. He answered me, choose tonight, if I am to miss you, or they. I pleaded for time to be given. He said, is it hard to decide? It will not seem hard in heaven to have followed the steps of your guide. I cast one look at the fields, then set my face to the town. He said, my child, do you yield? Will you leave the flowers for my crown? Then into his hand went mine, and into my heart came he, and I walk in a light divine, the path that I feared to see. We may not all be called to go and live in the town, but as I listen to Christ praying the night before he died, I hear him say again, I have sent them into the world as you sent me into the world. Let us pray. Father, we have to confess that we don't enjoy going into the world. It's a difficult place. It's an alien place. We don't feel we belong. We're social misfits. We find it much easier to be with your people than with those you came to save. Lord, we pray now that you will speak to your body as we enter this new decade. Will you show us what part of the world we can influence? Will you show us where you want us? Lord, we would ask very simply just two things. Lord, will you please put us in the world? And will you please take the world out of us? We realize that prayer is a very big prayer to pray but we nevertheless dare to ask it. For the sake of the world you love, Lord, call us again to go. For your name's sake. Amen. Okay, uh, this, this person's uh, challenge to us to go into the world and to be engaged in the world. I think sometimes it's easy for us just to remain in the church set up in the holy huddle and uh, don't go into the so-called dirty, sinful world. Uh, but that's not what Christians are called to do. As I shared yesterday, the whole body, life, image, uh, 
is not only for us to worship and glorify Christ, but to obey Christ when He sent us out into the world to be His hands and His feet. I think that's important for us to understand and to take into consideration for all of us. Uh, so, I hope John 17 uh, becomes alive for us that uh, we need to go into the world, but the world must not overcome us. We must overcome the world. 